Hello, everyone. Thank you for including me in this wonderful event. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, as well as the Wachabalik people um, on whose lands I did all my fieldwork up in, up in the Mallee. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So before I talk to you about measuring grass, I want to talk to you about why we care, you know, why is that important? And that's because of these woodlands up here, up in the Mallee. These are bull oak woodlands, and um, they're the focus of my management talk. So um, these are an endangered ecological community. They're found throughout the Murray-Darling Basin, but they've been, yeah, greatly reduced. Why? Because of um, extensive historical clearing uh, for grazing, for agriculture, and even though a lot of these stands are now found in national parks, they're still grazing by rabbits and by kangaroos and by goats. Um, and these inhibit the regeneration of um, any seedlings. So in some areas there hasn't been any regeneration for several decades, which is really worrying. So there was some study, uh, some work done several decades ago that looked at um, the diet of kangaroos and the proportion of grass in relation to how much grass was out, you know, available to them. So they found that below a certain amount which was about 400 kilos per hectare, which is not very much, um, they start to forage in other things, so shrubs or tree seedlings, and it's at this point that there is that, you know, that risk of browsing, which has happened here to this poor little bull oak seedling. That's yeah, never going to be a proper tree. Um, so why is this important? Well, managers want to know, you know, how much grass, how much food there is available to kangaroos, because although they carry out kangaroo culls to um, reduce that grazing pressure because there is no longer any, um, you know, the top predator has been removed, dingoes, there's no, not hunting anymore. So, um, yeah, to avoid an, uh, what do you call it, overpopulation of dingoes where they, you know, they might, when times are tough and there's not enough grass, they'll starve or, you know, inhibit the regeneration of vegetation yeah, they want to be able to refine and be more confident about whether they really need to cull and when. Um, yes. So, I sought to understand how much biomass varies in the landscape. So, how does, you know, where, where does grass grow? How much does it grow? What influences it? Um, so, the two questions I asked the first was in which areas of this park? are bull oak seedlings most at risk from browsing? And the second was, how do we best measure this risk at such a large scale? So to address the first one, I and some um, wonderful volunteers, we all went out and sampled biomass. So that was a lot of clipping and putting grass in bags and then drying and weighing. We sampled biomass over a period of two and a half years, went out in different seasons in really wet and really dry periods. Um, and we sample over a whole lot of vegetation types. So Pine Plains, where I did my field work, it's really patchy. There's dry lake beds. There's some black box woodlands and bull oak woodlands. Um, yes. So what we found was that... Uh, so here we see the orange lines. These are open sites, like the lake beds and the cleared grasslands, the cleared bull oak woodlands that didn't become grasslands. Um, and these are the wooded vegetation types. So we see that actually um, the wooded vegetation types are really uh, forage stress. There's not much grass growing, especially in summer and autumn, which are these December, April. You see the orange line that represents that uh, purported switch threshold, at which point kangaroos will start eating shrubs and tree seedlings. So in the drier months, the grass biomass is really likely to fall below that. And so that's really important because, you know, that's, that's when these seedlings are um, probably going to be eaten. And woodlands are also really important because western grey kangaroos, even though they will go out to open areas to forage because there's a lot of grass, they'll stay close to, uh, to trees because it'll provide them cover during the day especially and, and they can go and run into safety. Oops. Here we go. So... Even though field sampling, you know, it's fine for exploratory work, 
over time, if you want to monitor graph availability regularly at, over a large space, you know, it's really inefficient, it's really time consuming, very expensive, it's destructive. So what about measuring from space? And how do we do that? Well, you can use remote sensing, so satellites to do this. Um, satellites such as Landsat measure reflectance uh, from the Earth, so they go, they scan and they, they capture that reflectance. And so they measure in specific bands. So this is, for example, this is, um, these are the wavelengths, and here you have, this is the red band, with, and um, this is the near-infrared. So these two bands are really important for vegetation because red light is absorbed by green vegetation, whereas if it's brown, it'll reflect it. So when you have that difference, that's, that'll tell you, you know, whether there's green vegetation or not. Um, so a higher value here, for example, indicates that. So I explored different vegetation indices, so combinations of those bands, um, to see whether they could give, give a, a good indication of grass biomass. Um, it wasn't always very clear. Sometimes, you know, for example, these are two, two indices here associated with grass. One um, shows that actually there's, with this index there's less grass biomass. With this index it's associated with more grass biomass. It's a complex thing, you know, the, the relationship between the biomass and the reflectance because of a few reasons, one of them being tree cover. Landsat pixel sizes um, are 30 metre by 30 metre, so for each pixel there'll be a single reflectance value and that can be, that's an average of everything within that pixel. So if you have a lot of tree cover with green leaves and uh, like in this picture, you know, that suggests there's high biomass, but actually if you want to look at grass biomass, that's, um, it's not very clear what you get from that picture because there's not much happening underneath. It's not very green. Um, it can also, yeah, obscure the ground layer vegetation as well. Changes in soil moisture, the timing of rainfall events, the amount that will influence um, the biomass, and up in the semi-arid, you have really localised rain events sometimes. The amount of dry vegetation on the ground, so when you have a lot of dead vegetation, it actually gives um, a signal that's similar to bare ground. That's, yeah. So while there is more biomass in this picture than in that one, they have a similar value, which has different implications um, for food, for forage, if the kangaroos will eat the brown stuff as opposed to dirt. All right, so going back to those two questions that I had, one was... What are the areas where there are, the seedlings are most at risk of being browsed? Well, woodlands. That's a short answer. So we saw that grass biomass will pretty much always fall below that threshold in summer and, and uh, late summer and autumn. And kangaroos, they prefer these areas because of that, you know, that availability of, of grass in the open areas, but they're close to shelter. So that's, yeah, key area there. How can we best measure this at a large scale? So maybe not remote sensing unless you include other data to improve accuracy. Like, for example, we found that tree cover was really important, soil moisture as well. So un unless you have all of those other variables, um, remote sensing by itself, it's, it's a little complex. But I'm working on other methods, um, yeah, testing other methods that I use out in the field, for example, rising plate meter, which is a rod with a little cardboard plate. You drop it, measure the height. That's uh, quite a quick and effective uh, tool. Or um, a handheld scanner, which does the same thing as a satellite, but at a much finer spatial scale. So much more accurate, but more expensive. And um, there's also pasture models available online. They're much more coarse, but you know, testing whether they're actually enough for this purpose. So watch this space. Um, if you want to read more about what I've been doing, have a look at my two papers. Well, they're a bit small there, but open source. You can read more about them or just ask me. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank all my supervisors and my wonderful volunteers, and thank you all for listening.